This is a talk which is going to span various taxa, but it's all focused around the question of what does it mean to talk about a balanced diet. And these are really big questions in nutrition. And because they're big questions in, in nutritional science, they bear upon just about everything, not only in the natural world, but in terms of human health and even global geopolitics. So what is a balanced diet? It's something that we're urged to eat constantly. Our public health colleagues are telling us you should eat a healthy, balanced diet. We should know what that is, but I'm not so convinced that we actually do. What are the consequences of eating an imbalanced diet? That's the opposite to um, the health benefits of a balanced diet. Clearly, that would imply there are problems with eating an unbalanced diet. What might, what might those problems be? And is it true to say that diet balance is fixed for a population, let alone across a life course? The answer to that question is almost, um, almost inevitably no, but how do we actually quantify it? And that's a set of questions which we really don't know as much about as we ought, and in some ways it's because of the nature of the science of nutrition, which has tended to focus on single things rather than the entirety of the diet. We need many nutrients. Those nutrients come packaged in foods. Those foods are eaten in differing quantities and proportions to comprise diets, and those diets are eaten in differing patterns and in differing cultural contexts and so forth. And I think it's probably not unfair to say that until pretty recently we haven't had an equivalent body of theory for thinking about nutrition in that way as um, an integrated framework um, than, for example, we've had the benefit of in organismal biology. So if you take, for example, the theory of natural selection and the way that that has structured thought in biology ever since Darwin, nutrition really hasn't had that sort of a framework. I've spent a lot of my career with colleague David Robenheimer, who is now with me um, in the Charles Perkins Center, back with me after many years in Oxford, trying to put that right and to come up with an integrated framework for um, nutrition. One that really embraces the notion of balance and the multidimensionality of diet without being overfaced by it or end up really um, swamped by the detail of the dozens of different nutrients that all organisms require if they're to remain healthy. So what I'm going to do today is introduce you to some of these ideas. It's what we call nutritional geometry. And if you want to read more about it, there's a sort of manifesto of sorts that we published with Princeton University Press a couple of years ago, which sets out the logic of the models and how they might be used. And I'm going to use them today, and the, the introduction of the principles will sort of come as part of the use of them in solving or addressing particular problems. And we're going to span um, taxa that go from insects through to higher primates and ourselves along the way. But the first thing we need to get across is the nature of the models and the nature of the question um, of what is diet balance. And I'm going to use, in part of the talk, um, really simple two-dimensional representations of diet balance, just to get across the notion of what balance means. So, here we have a two-dimensional space. We call it a nutrient space. It could be an n-dimensional space because you can imagine just about every nutrient you can think of, micro, macro, could comprise a dimension in that space. But we're going to use, for illustrative purposes, just two for the moment. And I'm going to take the two major energy-yielding dimensions. Um, I'm going to put protein on one axis and I'm going to combine carbs and fat on another axis. So there's a two-dimensional space, which between those dimensions will comprise the majority of the energy in the diet of a typical organism. Now, over a given period of time, an animal, including me, 
will have a requirement for a certain amount of protein and a certain amount of non-protein energy. And in this two space, you could represent my requirement, if I'm talking about me, by what we could call an intake target. So if I was to attain that point in that two space by ingesting foods in appropriate quantities um, and compositions over that given period, let's say a day, then I would attain my intake target and when there would be in some form of perfect health. Now what that means we'll start to deconstruct. But you get the idea. That target will move It'll move both quantitatively and qualitatively as I go through my life, as I increase my um, exercise rates, as I change my reproductive status and go into older age and senescence. And so it's a moving target, but I'm going to consider them for much of the talk as static points integrated over a given period of time. Okay, so we've got a nutrient space and we've got nutrient requirements over a given period represented as a target. Whether or not I can get to my target depends on the foods that I have available to me. And what I'm going to do here is represent foods as lines that radiate out from the origin. And we call these things food rails to capture the idea that a food contains a particular mixture of its ingredient nutrients and other um, chemicals and other um, components. In this case, this um, food, which is represented by that red line, contains a, an equal ratio of protein to non-protein energy. And you can represent it as a food rail, and you'll see why in a minute. Now that would be a food which has an intermediate balance of protein to carbohydrate and fat. This would be a food that contains a low ratio of protein relative to carbohydrates and fat, and that one, a food with high protein to non-protein energy, carbohydrate and fat. We can also talk about eating. So when I start um, the day, let's say I commence my day at the origin, as I consume a food, then every mouthful I'm taking will take me along a trajectory in that nutrient space which is determined by the food ratio, the ratio of nutrients in the food. So if I was to eat this food, I would consume nutrients in that proportion and I would be able, therefore, to go directly to my intake target if I ate nothing but that food across the day. And by definition, that is therefore a balanced food. It's nutritionally balanced. By contrast, that's an imbalanced food, and so is that one, because by eating them, no matter how much I eat, I'm never going to get to my intake target. I'm going to be eating too much um, non-protein to protein energy as I do that, or vice versa here. But... If I were able to combine foods, let's say this one and this one, I could, by mixing my intake from these two foods, get to my intake target. I could be like a, a nutrient-seeking missile and get to that point. And they're, by definition, complementary foods, because this and this, although individually imbalanced, if you combine them, you can zigzag your way to your intake target. So there in a single slide, we've captured the notion of um, a nutrient space, requirements, foods, imbalanced and balanced foods, and complementary feeding. Now, it happens that that sort of way of thinking about regulatory systems also sets you up in an experimental framework to ask animals the question, are you able to demonstrate the capacity to regulate your intake of foods and nutrients to attain your intake target, wherever that may be. It sets up a whole experimental paradigm. And in particular, it allows you to ask the question, if you were to perturb the environment of the animal, does it show any evidence in its behavior that it's able to um, respond to that perturbation in a way that enables it to show homeostatic control of its nutrient intake. 
And if you're going to do that, you need to have experimental, uh, clever experiments where you challenge the animal by changing its feeding environment under control conditions and see whether it makes um, compensatory responses that lead it to get to its intake target. And I'm going to give you two examples of exactly that sort of experiment, one involving cockroaches and the other crickets. So here's, here's an experiment. If you estimate that the intake target of an animal is here and you force it onto a food which is imbalanced and won't ever allow it to get to there for a period and measure how much it eats, and then you give it access to two complementary foods, is it able, by mixing its intake from those complementary foods, to redress the, the initial perturbation and get back to its target? There's a question. And here's the experiment that was um, set up to address exactly that question. So what we did here was to take cockroaches and confine them for um, 48 hours to one of three foods, this one, this one, or this one, and the cockroaches confined to this food here ended up at the end of the 48 hours on average at that red triangle, um, these ones at that blue triangle, and these ones at that green triangle. The animals were then given free access to all three foods and their intake of protein and carbohydrate resulting from their food choices was then tracked cumulatively over the next four 10, 24, 48, and 120 hours. And what you'll notice here is that although you force them to start from different places because of that um, no choice pretreatment, in each case the animals tracked back to attain the same intake target. And that means, um, inevitably means, that these animals had the capacity to regulate their intake of both protein and carbohydrate separately to reach a point of intake of the two nutrients which reflects an intake target. So that's a beautiful piece of regulatory biology. It does indeed look very much like a nutrient-seeking missile. I'm going to give you another example now. This is a field-based example this is a thing called the Mormon cricket. Mormon cricket, surprise, surprise, lives in Utah and other areas in Northwest America. It forms huge marching bands. Each cricket is a flightless thing about as big as that, bigger than your thumb. This band crossed that road um, continuously for five days. Each cricket was moving about a kilometer a day. They're marching through the environment in serried ranks in a, in a highly cohesive way. And as they go, they're making very particular food choices. We wanted to know, amongst other things, um, why are they doing that? Why are they marching through the habitat? Why are they collectively organized in that way? And one of the first things that came to mind was that something about their nutritional environment may be significant. But they weren't stripping the habitat bare. They seemed to be selectively picking out certain types of foods in the environment. And that led us to run an experiment which involved putting, asking them the question, is there anything about your nutritional environment that has let you down or that you're particularly seeking in your movement through the environment? And so what we did was set up a, an experiment where we placed in front of the crickets, dishes containing different um, dry artificial diets, which are the same ones that we'd used in the experiment I just showed you on um, cockroaches and in locust experiments as well. Now, there were four dishes placed in front of the marching band. The one on the left contains both protein and carbohydrate, the two major energy yielding nutrients for this animal in 21% by dry, dry weight um, proportion. This one contained carbohydrate but no protein. This one, protein but no carbohydrate. And this one, neither protein nor carbohydrate, just the cellulose and salts and fats and other things present in all four. Now what you're noticing here is that these animals are encountering these dishes. 
they're able to make decisions as to whether or not to stop and eat them based on inputs coming from taste receptors on their feet and they're choosing to eat them um, according to the composition of the diet and I think if you just watch and you probably already have been watching you can see the decisions being taken on a very rapid time scale here comes an animal it bumps into the carbohydrate diet and it keeps going this one does the same and keeps going that one does the same bumps into the other one oh stops and starts to eat it <laughs> and you'll notice very very quickly that they're making oh dear what have I done I've done something I've killed it press the bottom one uh -huh. so what they're doing is making decisions which are really driven by whether or not the dish contained protein. You saw that they were stopping at the protein containing dishes. The reason for that is that being in very large numbers locally, they've selectively eaten the high protein food resources in their habitat and we showed that they were selectively deprived therefore of protein and anything that was proteinaceous would would be very stimulatory and stop them and they would eat it. But why then do they continue to march in such serried ranks and so um, cohesively together? The answer to that came from the fact that the, the nearest source of protein in your environment is the cricket in front of you and unless you keep moving, you get cannibalised. So cannibalism was a response to a specific deficit in protein imposed by the habitat mediated through the individual animal's protein appetite system and it basically scales up and you can show this in statistical physics models of collective movement it scales up to entire marching bands that can contain quite literally billions of animals and they consume an, an, another cricket in a single meal so this one ate one of its compatriots completely in about five minutes and that's so far as I know a record for an animal that chews its food in terms of meal size. So there we have another example where a, a nutritional regulatory response in this case plays out at a population level and can have huge consequences ecologically. The same thing happens in humans so we too have the capacity to regulate our macronutrient intake and I'm going to show you just um, very briefly an experiment that we uh, we ran quite recently in Jamaica using um, a series of subjects um, in um, in Jamaica where there were 63 adults who were given the opportunity to select among three menus comprising a whole series of different foods that were um, designed by us to um, be highly controlled in their composition with respect to mac macronutrients um, but variable and culture culturally relevant foods to the Jamaican population with whom we were working. We had 63 adults three days from three menus where they could select any food items they like and the menus contained 25, 15 or 10 percent protein. And again, I'm just going to collapse fat and carbs into a single dimension here. We're going to parse them a little bit later, but for now we're going to um, collapse them into a single dimension. And these are the actual intakes of protein, carbohydrate plus fat from those 63 adults across that three-day period where they had complete free choice. So they could have ended up anywhere in that blue region um, by eating foods from the three different menus if they combine them in various different ways. The actual data are shown here. Incredible tight um, aggregation of the data along a very close to 15 percent protein ratio. Individuals varied according to how far out they went along the line but you'll see them all very tightly clustered along the 15 percent line. In fact, 14.7% protein of total energy in the diet. If they'd eaten randomly between the foods available, they would have ended up in a very different position, statistically a highly different position. 
So this was really quite clear evidence that humans under those circumstances were able, um, had the capacity to make that selective response. And it's not just humans, it's also some of the higher primates where we've done experiments and found very similar things. So here's, here's one of those beautiful data sets that was collected um, by Johnson et al. and we reanalyzed their data for them. This is a single baboon followed for 30 consecutive days, foraging in an environment where it had access to it, all manner of different food items, which quite literally span rails or food rails that would allow it to go just about anywhere in that space. And you'll see that day after day, these are, these are cumulative intakes over that period of time, it, with high fidelity, tracked a 20% protein energy ratio. And that's an extraordinary piece of regulatory biology. So, capacity to regulate through complementary feeding food selection to an intake target is something that you see um, among a diversity of different organisms, ourselves included. But what happens if our diet or the diet of an, an, uh, any particular organism is imbalanced? For ecological reasons or for whatever other reason, the animal is confined to a diet that isn't able to achieve the intake target. What do you do? Well, that's a really important question and it's a really critical thing that we get to grips with now because uh, a lot of what follows is going to be dependent upon getting this. So, here's our target. Let's say you can find the animal to an imbalanced diet. What are the options? What can it do? Well, if you think about it, what it could do is eat until it gets to that point, but if it does that, it's going to get to the right amount, the target amount of carbohydrate or whatever that dimension happens to be, and in so doing, it will have consumed a deficit of protein. Or it could keep eating and eating and eating and eating, that particular food or diet until it gets to the red point whereupon it's attained its protein target but grossly exceeded its intake of the other dimensions and therefore of total energy. Or it could do something in the middle. And if you're going to measure what an animal does and what it, how it values those trade-offs, then the way to do it is to subject it to a whole series of different food treatments measure how much it eats on each of them, and then to join the dots. And here's one hypothetical example. Let's say you, um, you had worked out that the target is here, you can find the animal to a whole series of different foods, and the intakes achieved of protein, and in this case carbohydrate, lined up like this. What would that mean? It would mean that the animal is prioritizing its intake of carbohydrate. It may have the capacity to regulate both protein and carbohydrate to a target, but if it's unable to do that because of its environment, it will prioritize carbohydrate. Or it might prioritize protein. Or it might do something else that balances the over and under consumption of those two dimensions. Now what it does is an experimental question. It's not something that you can necessarily predict a priori. You need to go out and do the experiment and measure it and see what the animal actually does. I'm going to give you an example of where we've done this recently. Now this is led by colleague David Robenheimer, who I mentioned at the beginning. And the experiments were done by Erin Fogel. And this is in Borneo and this is involving a wild population of orangutans. What Erin did was watch 49 orangutans for seven years. A total of 2,233 full day observations. An absolutely extraordinary um, effort. And what she did was record everything that the orangutan ate for an entire day and then from that, we're able to extract the macronutrient intakes of the animals. Not only that, she ran around underneath the branches with a plastic bag on a stick, and every time the orang 
um, urinated, she would, she would run under and catch some of it for analysis. For markers indicative of lipogenesis um, or lipolysis and other things. Now you need to understand a little bit about the ecological context of orangutans to actually understand the data as they came out. And what I've shown here is a plot over time of the percentage of fruiting trees in the forest that actually were in fruit for the orangutans. And you'll notice that there are periods where you've got a certain amount of fruit available, um, so you've got some fruiting trees. In other occasions, you've got very high abundance of fruiting trees, and in others, extremely low, if, if any, fruiting trees. And what we found was that during periods where the orangutans had fruit and leaves available to them, because that's what they do. They eat fruit and they also eat leaves and they mix their diet from the two. Under those circumstances, where they had both fruit and leaves available, if you tracked individual orangutans, they, just like that baboon I showed you earlier, had great fidelity to a particular intake target ratio of protein to non-protein energy, fat and carbs combined. So here's three. Here's Junie and Mindy, who are two female orangs. Mindy had a child. Um, Junie was a non-pregnant female. And here's a boy called Sony. Sony had a higher protein to non-protein energy intake ratio, which probably reflects his greater muscle mass as a male. Um, Mindy ate more than Junie of the same ratio, probably reflecting the fact that she was feeding for two. But they were very clear examples of the animals making careful choices about the fruit and the leaves that they ate to balance a particular target ratio. But if you combine the data across all seasons, fruit abundant, fruit rare, then this is the plot, the scatter of data of protein versus non-protein energy intake. And that's an extraordinary data set. It shows this fantastic um, maintenance of protein intake consistently, prioritizing protein intake and allowing non-protein energy intake and hence total energy intake to vary hugely. More than that, we found the same thing when we analyzed another extraordinary um, young biologist, Annika Felton, who is a PhD student um, in Canberra, she came to us with her data set, which was 18 months of day-long observations of more than 30 Bolivian spider monkeys. And when we did the same analyses, we got the same pattern, this extraordinary regulation to a standard intake per day of protein, whereas non-protein energy intake varied hugely. So let's just take a closer look at that scatter of points. Let's expand it a little bit. So what we've done is taken that red area and just um, extended the protein axis. What's happening there? Well, we know that when the animals are in periods of medium fruit and leaves, then they'll regulate their intake. And if we take these two trajectories that I showed you earlier and superimpose them on these axes, we could estimate that the target is likely to lie somewhere around here. This is sort of Mindy and Juni versus Sunny, and this is the total scatter of all the animals across all of those observation periods. Now, during this period, fruit, fruit is scarce, and they're under-eating total energy. During um, that period, fruit is super abundant, and they're over-eating fats and carbohydrates. So there's an ecological driver of whether they're over or under consuming total energy, but they're maintaining protein intake constant throughout. More than that, if you look at their urine chemistry, during periods where they're on a low protein, high carbohydrate and fat diet, which is this high fruiting season, you'll notice that their C-peptide levels in the urine which is a measure of lipolysis, uh, sorry, lipogenesis, are very much higher than they are in, in um, dietary regions when they're on a lower carbohydrate, higher protein, leaf-based diet. 
So what we've got here is they're over-consuming total energy, and this red surface here, and I'm going to explain these surfaces in a bit because we're going to use a lot of them in a minute, that region here indicates that these animals, when they're over-consuming energy on fruit, are also putting on body fat. By contrast, when they're in this region, you have high levels of ketones in the, in the urine, so when they're on a higher protein, lower fat and carbohydrate leaf diet, then they've got a lot of ketones, which is indicative of their losing body fat. That's a lipolytic um, response. So, we have this cycling, therefore, across the season of the animal gaining and losing body fat according to the presence of fruit in the environment. And across a year, that balances out such that um, in periods when they're energy deficient, they have access to fat supplies. When there's periods of um, energy overabundance, then they gain that body fat to keep them through the next cycle. And therefore, this protein leverage effect, as we call it, this maintenance of protein intake consistent, which is used for all the other purposes that you need dietary protein for to grow and maintain yourself and reproduce, that drives and is consistent, whereas everything else goes up and down according to ecology. And that's what we call the protein leverage response. Is that potentially something that may help us explain our circumstance when it comes to, for example, the obesity epidemic? Well, let's ask the question, what is our scatter of points on a similar plot? What does that look like? Well, the answer is it looks remarkably similar to an orangutan or a Bolivian spider monkey. So what we have here is a meta-analysis of 38 published trials where human subjects were kept under very different methodologies, there's a whole range of methodologies, to, to diets for relatively extended periods that varied in their percent of protein relative to non-protein energy. You see the same signature. The human subjects have maintained their protein intake, they prioritise that much more than they have their non-protein energy intake. And what that means is that as you decrease the percent protein in the, to in the diet, available in the diet, then the total intake of calories goes up, whereas the absolute intake of protein remains remarkably stable. And that is particularly the case over the range of diets that actually reflect human ecology. So if you look across human populations across the world, providing this food sufficiency, the percent of protein of total energy is always between 10 and 25 percent. It, it doesn't go either side of those two. The Okinawans have the lowest recorded consistent protein um, percentage in the diet, and that's just under 10 percent. And what you'll note is across that range from 10 to 20 percent or 25 percent, you end up eating the same amount of protein, but as you dilute protein from 25 down to 10%, you'll drive increasing energy intake. And you see that response even when you put people under conditions where you tightly control and covertly manipulate the nature of the foods that you're giving them. So just as we did in Jamaica, we ran a trial in Sydney where we had people come in and stay in-house for week-long periods during which they had either 10, 15, or 25% dietary protein present in what they thought were exactly the same foods and menus week on week. And so here's an example. There's a 10% lunch versus a 25% lunch where the sushi rolls and the, and the wraps and the, and, and the sweet apricot scones were present in each occasion, were ranked equally palatably, but actually were different. For a whole week, everything was 10%, another week 15, another, another week 25%. And what our subjects did in those circumstances was to eat more total energy when they were on the 10% than on the higher protein regimes. And they did that, they ate 14% more total energy, and really interestingly, they did that by increasing their snacking between meals 
and in so doing they favoured the snack foods that were available to them which had savoury taste characteristics, umami and salt flavours. So we had savoury and sweet foods and they would select the savoury ones and that turns out, and there's subsequent work done on brain imaging that um, really supports this, to represent human protein-seeking behaviour. It doesn't extend to our eating one another necessarily, unless you've been in a, a leaky boat for many months, but it's the same sort of response. You seek the flavours that are associated with a higher probability of that food item containing protein. Umami flavour and salt are two um, sign stimuli, if you like, for a high probability of protein in that food. We find those flavours attractive, palatable when we're in a state of protein deficit. Now, when you couple that basic powerful biology, which made sense if you look at the ecology of an orangutan or a spider monkey, with our modern world, we have a terrible problem. And that is because the percentage of protein in the human diet has, has decreased over the last 60 years. Partly that's driven by industrialization of the food supply and is driven by economics. Protein is more expensive than carbs and fat. And therefore, there's an incentive, an economic incentive, to dilute it in the diet, both on the, on, on the part of consumers and also the producers of foods. You see that in its extreme form in the protein decoy industry, which is the industry that produces savoury snack foods. So they have all the taste characteristics of protein, but they're just fat and carbs. So, um, you know... Potato, potato crisps, the barbecue chip is the classic protein decoy. You can show the cost differential of macronutrients using these, these same geometric approaches. Um, so here's protein and non-protein energy and here we have a response surface which is measuring as a heat map the cost of different macronutrient combinations. It's driven by protein. Protein is the expensive nutrient, and that's why it gets taken out in the food supply to, to some small degree. We also have an evolutionary legacy which is encouraging us in the modern world to dilute protein in our diet, and that is that simple sugars and fats were rare in our ancestral environment, and we find them hugely palatable, particularly when they're combined. So here's another surface in which this time what we've plotted is protein versus fat and, and carbohydrate is also represented in that plot. And this is a, a surface re reflecting the palatability of foods. And you'll see that there's what's become known as the palatability bliss point, which is low protein, high fat, high carb, is considered to be the most fantastically tasty combination, the donut effect. And this reflects our ancestry. Um, these things were rare and prized in our ancestral environment. Adding to this is that we expend less energy probably than we used to, thermoregulatory energy and, and, and activity. That's disputed by some, but it's, it seems to some degree at least self-evident. And there's even an extraordinary possibility, and, and that is that with rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, there's been a measurable change, and quite a substantial one, and this is basic um, photosynthetic biology, in the carbohydrate to protein ratio of plants. And you put that together with protein leverage, and you potentially would drive over consumption of total energy. So maybe even climate change is playing a role. So, let's go back to the orangutan example and see how it is that our ecology has got so out of step with the ecology of something like an orangutan, which is at least a relative of sorts. So, in the orangutan case, if you remember, there are periods of overconsumption of energy and periods of underconsumption of energy, and orangs have the capacity to balance to an appropriate diet mixture if they have available foods that allow it. The overconsumption is due to fruit availability. They pig out on fruit when it's there. So what is it in our environment that is doing that? It certainly isn't fruit, 
A strong candidate, we think, is what have become known as the ultra-processed foods that have entered the human food chain, particularly the Western diet, over the last 50 years. They're mostly industrial ingredients. They have little or no whole foods in them. They're high energy, low fiber, and low in uh, nutrients, particularly low in protein relative to non-protein energy. Is it partly at least their responsibility, the introduction of ultra-processed foods that have led to protein dilution in the diet? Well, that's a question we have just started to address um, working with Carlos Monteiro and Yuri Martinez um, in Brazil, and he's the inventor of the term ultra-processed food. And so what we did with them was to take the N. Haynes data from the US, a, a really detailed um, population survey of 9,357 people. We sorted those people into five categories according to how much of their dietary intake came from ultra processed foods, one, hardly any, five, up to 70%. And then we plotted it in terms of the macronutrient ratios as I've been showing you so far. And this is the outcome. These are low, or from category one through to five, contribution of ultra processed foods. And you'll see they're lining up consistent with this protein leverage notion. If we expand that and have a little um, uh, focus in on that region that I showed you in the previous slide, so low up to high intakes of ultra-processed foods, then what you'll see is, is that as you increase the intake of ultra-processed foods in the diet, you decrease the percent of protein in the diet, and you increase the total energy intake in the diet. And so... Instead of fruit being overabundant in the environment and driving overconsumption for periods of the year, as it does in something like an orangutan, what we have is ultra-processed foods that are never in absence or in underabundance. So we go through a cycle of increase without the associated ecological decrease in body, um, body fat. So, macronutrient ratios, protein leverage, ecological and evolutionary context can all make a great deal of sense out of some of the complexities of the human nutritional condition. But what we need now to do is ask another question. It seems that like other primates and many other animals, we don't under-consume protein because protein is required for reproduction and growth and maintenance and all the rest of it. But equally, protein leverage means that we don't overconsume protein substantially either. We regulate both up and down to a target level. And as an evolutionary biologist, you would be left saying, well, why are we doing, why aren't we just overconsuming protein? If protein's so good for us, why don't we just eat more and more and more? It must be, therefore, that there's some sort of evolutionary cost to overconsuming protein. Well, what I'm going to do now is take you through some experiments on, initially on flies and then on mice for much of the rest of the talk, which actually address that question and start to bring in the health costs and consequences of macronutrient intake balance and using nutritional geometry to do it. I'm going to start with the fly. What we did here was an experiment, this is a few years ago now, where we took 1,006 Drosophila, female pre-mated Drosophila, and we confined them to one of 28 foods varying consistently um, or systematically in their protein to carbohydrate ratio. And they're the two major energy yielding macronutrients in the fly's diet. Fats are required but relatively minor proportion of the diet. Um, it's quite a useful experimental animal to use because it's pretty small and it doesn't live very long and one of the primary outcomes we were concerned about was how long the flies lived and how many eggs they laid. We wanted to look at these major life history variables as they responded to macronutrient intakes. So these flies were given one of 28 food mixtures and they were provided with them in five microliter pipettes and they're allowed to drink their diet as flies are wont to do. 
throughout their entire lives, and we measured how much they drank by measuring the meniscus as it goes down the tube each day. So it's actually kind of simple, but technically very tedious. 1,006 flies measured throughout their lifespan. Now what that gives you is the, the possibility to plot 1,006 points in a protein to carbohydrate intake space. And you'll see them all underlying here, these little gray dots. Each of those is a female fly's intake. Associated with each point is how many eggs she laid across her lifetime and how long she lived. And those data can be used to construct a response landscape, which is a very powerful device because it enables you to then measure, um, quite literally measure the response to nutrition of whatever that variable happens to be of interest. And then you plot that as a topological map. And I'm showing them here, and the convention I'm using is that they're heat maps. These are ISO lines, and the surfaces have their maximal elevation in the red, and they fall to their foothills in the dark blue. What I've shown here is a surface for lifespan and a surface for egg production. And what you'll note is that they have very clear topology, both of them but they're not the same shape. Now what that means is that on the same diet, you can't maximize both how long you live and how many eggs you lay. And the other thing you'll note is that they lived longest on a low protein, high carbohydrate diet. And if you increase that ratio by increasing the proportion of protein relative to carbohydrate, you fall down the foot towards the foothills of the um, longevity mountain. Lifetime egg production, however, had its peak on a higher protein to carbohydrate ratio and again would fall away if you went uh, in any direction away from that, but it's at a higher protein to carbohydrate ratio than that which supported greatest lifespan. And if you gave the flies a choice, like Cockroaches, they would behave like uh, nutrient-seeking missiles and they would balance a diet that maximized their egg production. And that's kind of what you would expect in terms of evolutionary biology. So here we have two landscapes and the um, conclusion is that it's not about calories that determine how long you live or how many eggs you lay. It's about the ratio and amount of protein relative to carbohydrate in the diet. We found the same basic pattern, low protein, high carbohydrate diets, prolonged life in a whole range of other species of insects, both social insects as it happens, ant colonies, bee colonies, and in single um, individual species uh, of species such as um, tephritid flies, drosophila, multiple studies on drosophila done by other groups. Um, crickets and so forth, seems to be a consistent signature. If you want to live a long time, a low protein, high carb diet is the way to do it. Which of course begs the question, is that true of mammals as well? Now to answer that question, we embarked on um, a challenging experiment, hugely challenging experiment in fact. It involved 900 C57 black six mice confined to one of 30 diets. Now this time we had to take account of fat because fat's an important part of the energy intake of an omnivore like a mouse. So we had 10 ratios of carbs, protein and fat in the diet and this is a dietary mixture simplex for those who, who are nerdy about such things. And you'll see there are 10 points. They're the 10 ratios that systematically sampled that pink triangle in protein, fat, carbohydrate space. Those diets were provided ad libitum, so the animal could eat when and, and how much it wanted at any time of the day or night, and they were presented at either two, three, or four kilograms per gram of total energy by adding cellulose, which is a non-digestible bulk. So 10 ratios, three energy densities, 30 diets, 900 mice, and very early on, we had to get rid of five of the diets, the very low energy, low protein diets, because the mice just, these were from weaning, just didn't thrive and they had to be taken out of the experiment, leaving 25 diets, 
and we either culled a proportion of the animals at 15 months of age, which is sort of late middle age if you're a mouse, or we let them go to the end of their life. And you can then start plotting exactly the same relationships and start to look at the relationship between diet and health outcome, longevity and anything else you like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through that experiment. Some of it was published in that paper and there's a series of other papers since and forthcoming which will, uh, are adding to the, the, the data analysis from that same study. Now, I'm going to have to just be a little bit more complicated than I have been for a minute. The same convention, we've got a surface with its red um, summit and its blue um, foothills. But this time, because we've got protein, carbohydrate, and fat, I can't show you a four-dimensional graph, three nutrients and one response variable. So what I'm going to do instead is cut through that surface in two planes. Protein versus carbohydrate sliced through the median of the fat intake dimension and protein versus fat sliced through the median for the carbohydrate dimension. As it happens, most of the action is going to be in the protein-carbohydrate slice, so you'll, you'll end up seeing um, mainly those. But what you'll note here is that lifespan was quite clearly longest on the low-protein, high-carb diets. Not low-protein, high-fat, that was bad, low protein, high carb diets, just as in flies. <clears throat> and you see that in medians, you see that in the actual lifespans as well. More than that, you're able then to say, okay, there's the longevity outcome. How does it relate to the known underlying biology of aging? And so I'm going to just show you a, a series of slices, which are the protein carb slices, showing you some of the known um, correlates of aging biology at the molecular and cellular level, and again plotted as response surfaces. So, mitochondrial function was enhanced on low protein, high carbohydrate diets. mTOR phosphorylation is a marker of um, pro aging outcomes, and it was lowest on low protein, high carb diets, highest on high protein low-carb diets. And actually, if you look at mTOR, um, one of the canonical pathways involved in aging, you see that mTOR activation is driven as a function of the ratio of circulating branched-chain amino acids in the blood in combination with the levels of glucose. So there's an interaction between those two, such that as you increase the protein-to-carbohydrate ratio in the diet, you increase the BCA to glucose ratio and you increase phosphorylation of mTOR and vice versa. If you decrease them, you decrease phosphorylation of mTOR. Telomeres were longest in the mice reared on the low protein, high carb diet. So the aging outcome was related to some of the known or are highly likely to be uh, involved in aging underlying biochemical pathways and metabolic pathways. More than that, the indicators of late life health were also driven in the same way. So here's a series of indicators of late life health plotted against protein to carbohydrate intake, again as response surfaces. Blood pressure was lowest on low protein, high carb diets. Immune markers were considered the, um, the healthiest. And I'm being grossly simplistic when I'm saying this, and each of these graphs can be expanded into an entire story. LDL cholesterol was lowest. The microbiota of the gut, you can plot in the same way. You can, you can plot the community ecology of the gut and its individual taxa as response surfaces. And I won't go into how we've done that or, or the, the detailed results of it, but it really was strongly determined by protein to carbohydrate ratio. Glucose tolerance was best on low protein, high carbohydrate intakes over a consistently um, a chronically fed condition into mid-late life. But the mice were fat. <laughs> Low-protein, high-carb mice were chubby. <laughs> 
They lived longest and they were healthiest, but they were obese. So there's something weird happening here. And the reason they were obese is exactly as you would predict from everything I've said earlier, and that is if you decrease the proportion of protein in the diet, energy intake goes up. And you'll see that in these energy intake surfaces, particularly when you're on a low protein, high fat diet, very high energy intakes. And associated with that, as energy intake goes up, driven by protein leverage, you end up with increased body fatness. But if you're on a low protein, high fat diet as a mouse, you die soon and you're incredibly in, uh, unhealthy. If you're on a low protein, high complex carbohydrate diet, by contrast, you're overweight, but you're long-lived and healthy. So we can dissociate here obesity from its metabolic consequences. And this gets at one of the really puzzling phenomena in, in human metabolic biology, which is that there is a small proportion of patients who seem to be obese but metabolically healthy. And we're right at the moment um, in the process of working with Jerry Greenfield at the Garvin, who has probably the best data set that exists in this area, to see whether those people that are healthy are those who are on a lower protein, high carb diet, as distinct from the unhealthy population. It's a hypothesis that we can test. But it, did, it gives you this conundrum. If you want to lose weight, then a high protein diet is brilliant. High percent protein will lead to underconsumption of total energy, as we showed earlier in all sorts of examples. And the problem is that if you maintain such a diet, you won't live very long because the opposite pathway is driven by a low protein, high carb diet. The longevity pathway is driven most strongly by that ratio. We need somehow to manage this. In late life, you'll live longest and be healthiest on a low protein, high carb diet, um, but you will be prone to overconsume. And at some point, you would, particularly if you're eating a junk carbohydrate diet, you may predict that that would lead to countermanding health effects that you would want, perhaps, ultimately to manage. How might you do that? I'm not going to spend any time particularly on that. You could have intermittent fasting. You could increase your energy expenditure. You could choose dietary protein sources that have low levels of the branch chain amino acids, which are the most active um, form in terms of driving the mTOR pathways. Or potentially you might look for targets that can dampen the protein appetite. And there is such a target now. FGF21 has turned out to be a candidate molecule. And here is a surface, the last one I'll show you, showing how protein intake and carbohydrate intake in the mice related to circulating levels of FGF21 which is produced by liver intercirculation. And you'll see that it's very much highest on low protein, high carb diets. And you get the same outcome when you do in vivo um, experiments in HEP-G2 cells. And it's looking as if the data on the elderly or at least mid to late life in humans are supporting exactly this notion that a low protein, high carbohydrate diet, and by that I mean healthy carbohydrates, I'm by no means suggesting that should include um, very lowly, um, well, sugars and other very um, low grade carbohydrates. But the same thing seems to be happening. And indeed, the longest living population on earth are the Okinawans, and they have a ratio of protein to carbohydrate in their diet that is exactly what caused our mice to live longest. And if you can start looking at the relationship between macronutrient balance in humans and outcomes in late life, as we've started to do using cohort studies such as the CHAMP study in, in Sydney, you can see, you can get topologies in things that matter to our late life health, uh, health such as cognitive function. Here's a, a map of cognitive function in relation to diet, and you'll see that a moderate protein, high carb diet supported best Many, uh, many mental health state examination scores, cognitive health 
in this population of elderly men, or at least it was associated um, one with the other. But, and this is the final but, if you're going to be maximally reproductive as a mouse, just like as in a fly, you need a high-protein diet. So you'll see all the measures in our mice of reproductive um, potential, males and females, were maximised on a higher-protein diet. So, what, it, what would you rather do? Do you want to lose weight? <laughs> high-protein diet, high-percent protein diets work brilliantly, and I've shown you why. They do because you don't eat as much, because of protein leverage. But if you want to live longer and stay healthier into your late life, having lost that weight, you shouldn't continue on that diet, we would predict. Um, unless you want to look younger, um, you'll die a gorgeous corpse, um, but it'll be, it'll be sooner than it perhaps ought to have been. Or do you want to have children? And what it shows and, and what it allows you to quantify is that diet can help manipulate and achieve any outcome that you can imagine just about, but not all the same diet. You can't think of diet balance as if it's a single thing. It depends on circumstance, on life course, on population. And unless we start to understand those relationships, and here's a tool to allow us to do it, we're not going to get any further than we are at the moment, um, pointlessly arguing over whether the obesity crisis is caused by saturated fat or sugar. That is utter idiocy, and it it just denies the centrality of nutrient balance in nutrition, and that's what we've got to take charge of. So with that, I'm going to end um, with acknowledgements to all manner of colleagues. David Robenheimer, I've mentioned several times. David Lacuta, gerontology colleague, a whole bunch of, of students and postdocs over many years and other colleagues. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>